thank you for coming. I'm actually very excited to be um, the moderator for this session. I will go very, very quickly with two words about me, and I, I mean, at least on uh, why I'm here and why I'm doing the moderator here. Uh, so welcome again to Sustainable Tourism and Travel Panel. It is a beautiful, a very interesting topic that I really care about. And just a few words. I'm here because I actually just started as assistant professor at Franklin in environmental science. Uh, while I was doing my um, uh, bachelor in Milan and then natural science and then master and uh, uh, PhD University of uh, Insubria, that is uh, one uh, wrong name there, so University of Insubria, the second one in Italy, and then I continue with part of my PhD and then the postdoc in uh, University of Geneva, always uh, specialized on climate change mainly, and specifically on climate change impacts on vegetation, but vegetation which is living in very hard conditions, uh, so they are, they are the most sensitive to what is happening now. Um, I will not go too deep into that, so if you have any kind of interest or questions, please write me. Uh, I think I had here my email, and I'm very much uh, then happy to give you some uh, insights to the research. Uh, here was a very quick uh, insight on what are ring width and wood anatomy, that, I was, that is what I was working on and I am working on, uh, but so again, we are, don't have so much time, so I will skip it and uh, keep you, if you have any question at all, just please ask me. Um, then, I am here because I just started, as I said, as an assistant professor. I am starting this semester with biology, genetics, evolution, ecology, sustainability science especially, which is one of my favorites for now. Um, next semester, I will go a little bit deeper to the environmental part with also climate change, and specifically uh, for the first year seminars and uh, um, other courses. And then, um, there will be the very um, uh, important one for me and for most of the students is the tourism and the environment, uh, and the environment in Iceland. Uh, just two words about academic travels here at Franklin. Academic travels are one of the unique journey of, offered by FUS, so from Franklin University. It's really a distinct point of our university and it's great because it's really the time where students can finally understand what, it, what, what does it mean what they study uh, and understand, them, understand it with their uh, hands, let's say, going in person to the field and finally understand what they're really learning, which is not always easy to achieve. Um, so uh, my academic travel for next year will be uh, in Iceland and will be uh, related to sustainabil sustainability and uh, sustainable tourism and the environment. I am an environmental uh, science, let's say, um, sort of expert, so I will focus more the course on the environment and especially on the effects of on the environment. So uh, we will cover different topics on like what is tourism, uh, how many kind of tourism we have, and uh, the very challenging uh, relationship between tourism and the environment, which is really tricky because without the environment, we don't have tourism. So it's really uh, extremely important to understand the effect that could be positive, but could be also negative. Um, then today, uh, anyway, we will have the very uh, beautiful chance to speak with experts of the, um, uh, of the topic and of the sector about tourism and everything related to sustainable tourism. So how we can approach and how we can really uh, do something and deal with the problem. Um, here there are only five, but we have a last uh, addition to, uh, the, um, um, uh, to the list. So we have Alan Quaglieri which you can, it's, it's okay, sorry, it's, it's, it's behind, but it will come back. <laughs> Technical problems. Uh, then Alexandra Tozun, tell me if I'm wrong with the pronunciation, please. Uh, Camilla Dagani, uh, Engbert Ruth, Ruth, sorry again for pronunciation, and Robert Carney, and then here. Uh, and then uh, Bruno here, you can, <laughs> 
so I actually just will go very quickly uh, on each of them. Uh, they have an amazing life, amazing experiences, so it would be very difficult to uh, really give them the, 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 the space that they need to, to the, for, a, for a real presentation, but I will try to do my best. So I just pick the main um, um, topics and the main, the, let, let's say, the highlights of, their, uh, of the biography that they, they send us. Uh, so maybe, I don't know if Alan, I, I will just say, Alan Quaglieri is uh, it's, uh, disappeared, uh, it's, it's here, it's him. Here. It's yeah. him. <laughs> okay, he had his PhD in tourism and leisure at the University of Spain, of, uh, it, tell me if it's something wrong, uh, University of Tarragona in Spain, yes. right? Uh, then he did his, his master's degree in tourism management and planning, University uh, of Tarragona, Spain, and a degree in economics from Bocconi University in Milan. Um, he is now a lecturer at SUPSIP, yes. um, and in collaboration with uh, other universities, mainly foc um, in uh, focus in Spain, if I, yes. Um, and he is a, a researcher in tourism and urban studies. Um, so he did uh, several scientific papers and uh, scientific book chapters uh, uh, like related to urban tourism, urban studies, uh, mobilities and digital platforms in the hospita oh, sorry, <laughs> hospitality industry among others. Um, and uh, by analyzing all the tourism phenom phenomenon, he have come across issues related to sustainability. And then he will have the chance to present uh, his um, insight into social, uh, into tourism, social sustainability, governance, community participation, and so on. Thank you so much. So, yes, so I, again, sorry if I go a little bit quick. But <laughs> Uh, Alexandra Tozun, well now we have in uh, alphabetical order, so sorry for, uh, did, I didn't ask for uh, who wanted to go first. Uh, Alexandra Tozun, also is the pronunciation right? Perfect. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Uh, so she has a bachelor's in, uh, in business uh, and administration um, in Lucerne University of Applied Science and Arts. Uh, working as PR and advertising before starting her own camp company, and she actually a co-founder of Indie Guide, um, so responsible for customer and host success, marketing and strategic uh, partnership, and uh, the sustainable, sustainable tourism approach has always been part of the uh, Indie Guide, and uh, everything was, for what I understood, is was built at this aim, and also here we will have the chance to hear more about it. Uh, Camilla Dagani, uh, she's a marketing assistant to Lugano Region Tourism uh, Board. Um, she is the one cha in charge of sustainability for uh, the tourist board of the Lugano Region. Um, so we will listen something about uh, Lugano Region and what they do uh, on the tourism and sustainable tourism part. And indeed, Lugano Region always uh, have promoted uh, different kind of tourism, trying to put sustainability always in the center of uh, their approach. Tangled Rose, so he, uh, uh, every time you can stop me if you want to add something, of course. <laughs> Uh, so, <laughs> Engelbert Rose is a PhD, he has a PhD in, bi uh, in biology and a master in museum science from the university in Bern and Basel. Uh, he is a lecturer uh, of the course Tourism and World Heritage at UZ, uh, master in international tourism. Um, also, he is a research associate for the UZ UNESCO chair in ICT, so information communication technologies, and um, like uh, is, uh, was uh, focused on developing and propose, uh, promoting always sustainability, sustainable tourism in the World Heritage Sites. Um, so he was a former director, he is a former director of the UNESCO, uh, the Regional Bureau for Science and Culture in Europe in Venice, and responsible for the UNESCO prog program's implementation in Southeast Europe, and other than member of the UN Director uh, Conference for Europe in Geneva. Uh, so is uh, going on with a lot of research, uh, including governance and management of UNESCO design sites. Uh, very interesting for our sustainable tourism uh, topic. 
um, so uh, which uh, he can s valorize and um, uh, all the cultural and natural heritage for the local development that it's really, again, very important and um, highly relevant. Um, then we have uh, Robert Carney. Uh, who, uh, he is a formerly and, uh, a wild and exotic animal trainer, is expertise in conservation with particular focus on sustainability. Um, uh, he was focusing on behavior management for conservation of endangered, endangered species. Um, again, also part of an adventure travel company and a former director for the Varacruz Reef System National Park and Consumer Reef National Park. So he also has a, a very long and beautiful biography and uh, experiences in life, and we will be delighted to listen uh, to what he has to say. Uh, and finally, sorry for the last one. Bruno, if you can briefly introduce yourself. Yes. Yeah. Thank you very much for the invitation. And uh, my name is Bruno Golferini, and uh, I manage and work in uh, Villa Alceo, which is a boutique hotel near Lake Como. We organize uh, weddings and, uh, and events, and uh, we care a lot about sustainability, as I will tell you later on, because uh, we, we produce and farm raise everything that uh, we, we give to the guests. Perfect, thank you. Um, so now, uh, I think the first speaker still needs some minutes to manage through the S presentation. Yes, I will give you okay. a few minutes now. And okay. I'll try to send you this in Slack together. Okay, so maybe we can oh, yeah. start it with... Sense, yes. yes. Okay, so we can start with the second in line alphabetically. Uh, so Alan, no, it's you. Uh, so Alexandra Tuzun. And I will go with your presentation. So hello everyone, thanks very much for inviting us, hello me. Um, yeah, as I said, um, as was said before, I come from a very practical approach, so we are actually really in the tourism industry, we are an online marketplace for local hosts uh, in, we say, underrated destinations, and yes, so our business idea was actually created out of a, out of a social responsible thought already because we are, were approached by these fine gentlemen here while we tra were traveling in Mongolia asking us, hey, can you send us more travelers? We want to show our culture to more travelers. And that's how the whole idea to connect travelers with, um, with uh, local people was uh, created, yes. So our goal was always um, to empower local communities and to really bring even guides or host in rural areas, in underrated destinations, to online and give them a chance to be part of international tourism. And on the other hand, give, um, give open-minded travelers, as we were actually at the time ourselves, a real authentic experience, something that is memorable, something they will remember. For us, it was a life-changing moment. I mean, it doesn't have to be always life-changing, but at least something that you can remember. So this was why we created this uh, business idea. And I want to give you some practices on how we do responsible tourism and how we integrate responsible tourism in our daily work. So one of the things is I think is important from the traveler's side is um, we promote slow tourism, meaning staying longer in one country, do multi-country multi trips, stay longer in an area, really get to know the culture, and just do maybe once a life, once in a year a bigger trip rather than just hopping around and you know getting everywhere very quick. On the other side, I said that before putting locals first, so it's a really big mission of ours that we can give as much money back to the communities and the country or the local people in the countries we work with um, to say that the money stays actually in the country. We take a very low commission and that everything can stay actually in the country again. We also do support as much women-owned business as we can. And also, as I said before, there are really people in rural areas that maybe don't even have an online uh, 
platform so that they have a chance to be also part of tourism. Promoting off the beaten areas, this is a fight against over-tourism we are doing. So really trying to show people that there are other places also worth exploring in the world, not only where mass tourism is already, the already overcrowded places, so really say, telling them that there's different places as well worth visiting. Creating interaction and for cultural exchange, I think this is also something we really like to do, bringing people together. Like I said that before, people after COVID, they want to travel in a more immersive way, they want to explore more, they want to really get to know a culture. So um, we have some nice experiences where people really can meet, not like the sort of cultural shows, but really be a part of a daily life of local people, so there is an actual um, connection between humans. Preserving tradition and culture in this uh, e uh, example here, also Mongolia, this is a Kazakh people, they are hunting with eagles since thousands of years. This tradition probably would not be passed on as much anymore because, you know, young people, they want to do something else. But because of tourism and because people want to see this, um, this could be well preserved and also people, they are, it's, it's passing over to the younger generation, even to young girls, which was not always, uh, what was not the, the usual case at the, uh, until now and this is always I mean it has uh, both mixed beneficials but if it's done right this can really be a nice part to preserve culture um, being part we also try to be part of sustainable tourism development projects um, here I think it's very important to also understand that if you do such project it's important to look to work with local people, that the local people also have a saying in what is going on and they have a voice. Uh, we worked here as well um, with a, a UNWTO um, Silk Road project together and this is a good example how it can be done together with local people. Supporting conservational program projects rather than um, other like in Central Asia, in the area, there were hunting trips were very much um, popular at the one time. Nowadays, it's, it, we can see we don't do this. We rather promote conservation programs or tours that have to do with conservation because also the, there is a demand from, from the people. People want to see now the animals rather than, than do something else. Presenting and protecting cultural heritage, this has to do with UNESCO as well. Um, UNESCO World Heritage Site, always oh, an important, in this area also an important part. Um, educating people of how you can, how you deal with it and also um, managing tourism flow in this, related to this. Um, has a lot to do with also religious and tourism and pilgrimage. Promoting seasonal travel, you know, just really show people that there's not one season you can travel in a different area, like also promote other seasons that the, the, the work opportunities for the local people is steady and uh, the, you were, um, around the year, like they have, have work opportunities. Support on local communities. Um, this example here, we had a dentist coming to Kazakhstan, fixing teeth voluntarily, so we try to include this uh, sort of local projects together with um, touristic products, with volunteers sometimes. So this is always, we have something, we have, st we have stuff in education, we have stuff in uh, infrastructure and projects in health as well. Provide education, of course, we always try to share as much knowledge and tourism insights on sustainability and other trends as we can with for our local people, for our locals and hosts. It's important, as we heard before, conservation. Um, nature is one of the main points why people travel, and it's important to tell local, also local communities why they have to protect their environment, why they have to protect their natural habitat, because otherwise nobody will come and nobody wants to see it. So this is a big part of our work as well. Uh, we are in this uh, responsible tourism approach, but we are also very much believers in this transformational tourism. So we really think that tourism can change a, per a person's behavior and their perspective. It can change a 
it can create acceptance, it can create tolerance, and this really has a positive impact in the world. And if we do it right, and we can create those win-win situations we try to create with sustainable, sustainable tourism. Um, yeah, we, have a, we can satisfy all the stakeholders and hopefully this will last for future generations. Thank you. Thank you so much. So I will actually prefer to go on with the presentations and then see if we have time later for questions so that everybody, we are sure that everybody have enough time for expre uh, expressing what they uh, want to present. Uh, so now we are seeing in one sec if we can maybe, yes, we can, please, thank you. Um, we can come back to the first one, Alin Palieri um, from SUMSI. Hello, Agi. And in a few seconds should be, should arrive the presentation. It is downloading, it's almost done. <laughs> okay. uh, sorry for this inconvenience, but uh, this is one of those days when everything has to go wrong, it goes wrong. And <laughs> technology is not always so friendly. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Thank Here you. we are. Uh, do you have the... Yes, yes. So very briefly, I try to be very concise, something very challenging for me, but I will try to do my best. I'm going to well, present uh, some point and some uh, reflection uh, related with uh, the community uh, participation in tourism governance, okay? Uh, what is, well, we will see uh, what is community participation, but we can say it's a principle and at the same time it's a tool. We'll not say for ensuring, but for uh, uh, developing further the sustainability uh, of uh, tourism uh, activity. And this is a concept strictly related, uh, particularly with uh, social sustainability. We know that sustainability is not just something uh, related with environmental issues, so there are other colors other than green related with sustainability, and community participation is particularly related with the social pillar of uh, sustainability. And I think about so social sustainability is also thinking about uh, the impact uh, of tourism and the benefits and the drawback that the tourism activity can develop on the territory and in fact on the uh, well-being of the individuals and the groups uh, uh, co uh, that comprise uh, a community. And well-being is also a very complex concept, particularly because it's very difficult to be to assess uh, because we can also rely on some uh, um, objective in the, uh, indicators, but many other aspects can be just assessed uh, by asking to the individuals concerned, to the stakeholders, because they are the only legitimated for assessing uh, certain kind of impacts uh, on their well-being and daily life. Okay. So it's important to ask to them, not only think about what could be useful, could be important for them. It's not just to think about the community, but ask to the community. Otherwise, in certain situation, uh, particularly when tourism reaches the mature stage and high pressure on certain areas, for example, in a city like Barcelona, then we have this kind of reaction. Uh, this is, is a, there are pictures uh, of a rally against uh, the Airbnb phenomenon in the Barceloneta neighborhood, maybe those who visit Barcelona know no, the, the uh, seaside uh, neighborhood in the old town district of the, of the city of Barcelona. Other situation like the one experienced in, in central Australia and around the site of Uluru, Oyers Rock, one of the most known uh, tourism uh, resources in the country, uh, that was uh, uh, characterized by this struggle of part of the local community, the Aboriginal communities, they have a different approach to this site uh, and uh, give to this uh, monolith a different meanings. Uh, they, uh, and for them it's something holy. So there is a sacredness uh, around this site that is not compatible from their perspective with 
uh, the tourist uh, or a kind of tourist practices promoted by the tour, uh, the tour operators and the visitors. So the, the end of this story was that the federal government decided to ban uh, to tourists to climb uh, the, the site and try to compatibilize uh, the visit around the site with the uh, sacredness uh, of the site for a part of the local community. So it's uh, community participation that's about uh, uh, tourist government, okay? So to enlarge the decision about uh, or to structure the tourist development in an area by including uh, uh, diff the, all the stakeholders. Unfortunately, traditionally, the, the stakeholders that were mainly involved were the, the main representative of tourism industry. They were legitimately participating in this process, but uh, uh, other stakeholders, other social actors in territory used to be, uh, for example. Okay. So we need also to develop different approaches also in tourist governance by including all the stakeholders and provide them to the, uh, with the proper weight in, in, in within the decisional process. Why this? Well, because uh, well, the, uh, the local community can play different roles, okay? From one side, uh, can develop uh, some action and, some, uh, uh, and provide some services also to the visitor, uh, being s uh, a, a strategic uh, tool for strengthening the competitiveness and attractiveness of the territory, like we also saw in some of the picture and, the, and uh, uh, let me say by, uh, sorry, is your name? Alexander. Alexander, sorry, okay. But more other than this, and for me it's more important, the community has to be involved also because she ha uh, it has the right to be involved because it's, leg it's a participation, it's a duty for those who lead the process uh, of uh, governing the, the tourist development in a territory. So it's a matter of democracy at the end, okay? So provide this uh, decisional process with the proper legitimacy and representativeness. There are different examples, uh, uh, a different model through which we can include uh, and uh, stimulate the participation of the local community. It also depends on the specific context. This is a picture related with some uh, of these meetings with uh, representatives of social association in, in, uh, in the city of Barcelona. And this is, is a process, uh, the, first, the first time in, uh, in the frame of the um, strategic plan of tourism 2020 that was approved and defined in 2017, it was the first time in the city where uh, there was a strong bet on uh, developing this mechanism uh, for uh, really involve uh, uh, the community, uh, different groups make, uh, belonging to this community or individuals that were uh, entitled for participating in this kind of session and then be considered in their insights, in their proposals, in their concern. Okay. And now for finishing, I have maybe one minute more. Uh, another and a specific form, sorry, of uh, uh, community participation in the one, uh, is the one known uh, with the term community-based tourism. Okay, maybe some of you already heard about, there are different definitions, okay? But all agreed, uh, we can say at least in two aspects. For one side, the most visible feature of this, uh, uh, of this um, model is the fact that the tourists and visitors can spend uh, uh, their time during their st the stay in a territory within the community by sharing activities uh, with members of this community and be hosted in their homes, uh, okay, be part of the daily life or experience directly with uh, the locals, uh, uh, their daily life, okay? But what is most important is the fact that, that this member of the community, other than being providers of tourism experience and co-produce the tourist feeder, they decide about how to develop tourism activity, how to design tourist experience for visitor, and they decide uh, about uh, the whole tourist development of territory, okay? Obviously, this is not completely alone, but in collaboration also with public bodies and for the private sector, but they have a central uh, role in the community. This is the most known example uh, in 
literature come from the Andinian region uh, with the uh, indigenous community Quechua Aymara in the highlands uh, or in the Titicaca Lake. But there are other examples in also in urban environment, like the one uh, related with uh, slum tourism or favela tourism, but developed according to the principle of community-based tourism, the known case of Santa Marta. Also in the global north, so closer to, to our uh, context, they are inspiring example. I hear I just mentioned the one developed in Italy in Succiso, uh, in the Succiso town in uh, Reggio Emilia, in the Emilian App Appennini, to say in, in, in English, that was also awarded by uh, in 2018 by the UNWTO with innovation, uh, in an innovation program. And uh, is a model based relying on the community cooperative, the, the specific uh, legal figure that uh, uh, promotes uh, the cooperation between the members, normally of uh, small and uh, rural uh, communities, where the citizens actively de develop uh, act uh, sorry, activities uh, and services. In that case, they decide particularly for struggling against the demographic crisis that the town was experiencing, okay, to reopen a bar that were closed, a restaurant, but according to this uh, cooperative uh, uh, dynamic, and then become, uh, they open like a production, uh, cheese production, and they thought to link those activity to the tourism, uh, to the tourism um, demand, because they were aware that there is an increased interest also for this kind of experience, and this win-win situation were uh, finally uh, achieved. And now I stop because I think <laughs> I go. <laughs> <Thank> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> it's perfect. Thank you very much. Uh, very interesting. <laughs> so I will pass by to the third one. If you uh, are okay with it, I will go with Professor Engelbert Roth. Is it fine? Uh, we'll just... Quickly, go, ahead. go to your presentation. Uh, okay. I just stand up so that you can see the whole picture. Yes. Thank so you. I will talk about a very small project, a micro project, but nevertheless, <laughs> it is very, very difficult to implement. So this is the Arbostra Heritage Destination, which is nearby here. So the Arbostra is this mountain over here with Morcote. This is Italy, Porto Ceresio, and then the World Heritage Site, uh, Monte, uh, Monza Generoso. So the heritage des destinations are particularly sensible to changing visitors flows and increasingly suffer negative impacts from over tourism. So that's why I have chosen the heritage destination term because uh, I think these are different because you need a huge conservation effort in these places. It's not just uh, a tourism place. So the pandemic has led to a shift from real to virtual travel and correspondingly an increase in digital processes. Future sustainable tourism needs to consider the interwoven physical and digital environments and the changed digital mobility of people as we call it today, combining these uh, digital and physical issues. So during participatory processes, the project defines Arbostra's products and services and their sustainability values. It uses digital media as a management tool in all travel phases before, during and after to adopt a balanced flow of visitors. The final step is the creation of an Arbostra card application that covers all tourism related facilities and intensivizes stakeholders and visitors offering and choosing sustainable tourism products and services. By interconnecting similar heritage destinations into network, the visitors can profit from the bonus from sustainable offers for their future travels. So I have just read this summary in order to make it brief for everybody to have an overview on the whole issue and I would like to go shortly in a couple of details. 
So the Arbostra era, area is the focus creation of a sustainable tourism destination for the Arbostra mountain area with Morcote at its southern slope. So this here is Morcote with the uh, church on the top of the hill. Then Arbostra, it is a half island surrounded by the Lake Ceresio and Lugano facing towards south to the Monte San Ge uh, Giorgio, UNESCO World Heritage Site. And the destinations will include the municipalities of Morcote, Vico Morcote, Melide and Lugano, including Carona especially. The villages have around 4,000 resident population, but during the main season, the population increases up to 10 times, mainly also through second house uh, tourists. Then the tourism is uh, uh, in the historic center of Morcote and Carona, the hit and run tourism dominates. So people arrive uh, in the morning and leave in the afternoon already. So travels arrive mainly by car uh, or bicycles. Al also the public transportation by train, bus and boat is well organized. So the question is always, why are people still coming by car if they have all the facilities of public transportation? Then the hospitality infrastructure and services have high seasonal variability. And also I think a major problem is that the quality tourism in these places is not really well developed and several hotels are also closed as well as restaurants. So the methodology, I called it uh, sustainable development implementation methodology because it's not about only sustainable development, it's about implementation, and implementation is much, much more difficult than talking about. So this is uh, the method uh, which we have developed in about 30 years of uh, activities, uh, which supports territorial management and participatory processes. It is a three-dimensional governance and management model. It includes bottom-up, top-down and outside-in that was established based on the experiences of the process building of the Entlebu Biosphere Reserve. We find and verify the national and international programs. So I was the responsible for this uh, UNESCO Biosphere Reserve Entlebu and we have in five years built up such a sustainable um, area, region, and it was the ever first um, uh, large protected areas worldwide and in the field of UNESCO, which has made a bottom-up process. So people could decide in a referendum whether they want to be in a biosphere reserve and whether they want to contribute with financial contribution to this impl uh, the implementation maintenance of the biosphere reserve. So it's now 20 years ago and they have received last year the award from UNESCO to be one of the most uh, successful sustainable uh, territorial uh, area. So this, um, yeah, we have then started with a bottom-up first, so they told, yeah, you are a very, very nice example of a bottom-up, but actually it's much more, because the frameworks are coming top-down, so the uh, frameworks and deliberative policy is top-down, we have to adjust to regulations, UN, WTO, UNESCO, and so on. Uh, but then we have a very important issue today. This is the uh, outside-in effect. That means science and research, but also the networks, partnerships, and today mainly also the social media. So the ICT is a very important part of such a development program. So what are the aims and objectives of the sustainable heritage destination? Take care of the delicate balance between heritage, digital and physical travel and inhabitants and visitors while preventing negative impacts on the social and natural systems. To establish this bottom-up, top-down and outside-in uh, uh, system, then develop, introduce a sustainability incentive system to build quality tourism based on local resources 
and interlink the heritage destinations networks, for instance, with the Monte San Giorgio, where we look every day, actually. So uh, improve locals and visitors' experience and awareness towards heritage and introduce this kind of digital mobility and offers. And the phases of implementation, this is the identification of des destinations, products and services. I thought it's much easier, but it's one of the first and uh, most difficult part because it needs the involvement of the stakeholders and they usually are not really eager to collaborate. Classification of the sustainability of products and services, also this needs the involvement of the stakeholders and this is very difficult. How to quantify sustainability in a tourism destination? So which of the products is more sustainable than another one, or which hotel or restaurant is more sustainable than another one. So these are very difficult questions to, to uh, solve, to, to answer. Common digital media platform and Arbostora application. So that means that we can go with an Arbostora card wherever we want in the whole destinations. We do not need a portfolio, we don't need uh, any other instruments, we just have on the smartphone an application and we can do everything with that application from paying to uh, ordering to information to connect to uh, local communities, whatever. And what uh, is the most important incentive system means that uh, people want to profit from being sustainable. So the every first question is always, what's in it for me? And uh, if you do not answer this and solve this, nobody will join your activities with regard to sustainability. So we have now worked on a uh, concept which would allow that you can profit by a bonus system like uh, from air companies or Coop or whoever, uh, that you can profit from uh, behaving sustainable and using products and services which are sustainable. So at the end that you can use the bonus in order to travel again to other uh, destinations or you can use uh, also to as a donation to the maintenance for cultural heritage for instance. Thank you. Awesome. It's, yeah, it's, I, I will. We, we are a bit uh, short of time, but <laughs> no, it's okay. I was going to do it. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much. Thank you. It was actually very interesting, and personally, I really love this topic. Also, for our local environments here in Ticino, which it's really one of the best and the uh, extremely important and hot spot of biodiversity in all Switzerland. So I think that all everything that regards heritage conservation uh, is really to, uh, to, we have to keep it in the center of our interest and our in in the at, uh, attentions. Uh, also, what you said about sustainability is always, yes, always a challenge to put together all uh, the different systems between environment, between social uh, part, between the economic part. So it's social sustainability science is something that is growing now um, and we will have time, I hope, to uh, improve all the approaches, but yes, until now it's still always challenging to put everything together and manage to uh, um, have a comprehensive approach that is most of the time very, very difficult. But we can go on. Um, sorry for the time. We are a little bit behind, but I would uh, proceed with uh, directly with, oops, I can share. And you, um, you had your present, you, yeah, you said that you prefer no presentation, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah just Okay, that. so uh, actually uh, we can go directly with Robert Carney. In, in I'd rather time. stand up and if you can, if I can use the, just here to lay yeah. this thing. Yeah, of course. There we go, thank you. Um, yeah, we're running a little late on time, so I'll try to speed things up a little bit. I had a whole bunch of things I want to talk about, but anyway, we'll just go straight mm -hmm. into it. Um, just a quick thing about my background. I started off um, as, as an adventure travel guide, 
and through doing this, I got eventually invited into being a member of Mexico's uh, Protected Natural Area Program, where uh, because of my background, I was in charge of tourism in protected natural areas. So this gave me a real good background in understanding things that were going on. Um, and in doing so, while I was uh, the director of tourism in protected natural areas, being the, the focus point for the environmental side of government, I was tasked to work with the tourism board of the federal government to come up with a strategy for well, what they called sustainable tourism. And right from the beginning, we had a difference there because we would see there's no such thing as sustainable tourism. We can talk about sustainability and how tourism impacts sustainability, but there's no such thing. We, I'm putting a label on tourism and saying, this is sustainable tourism, right off the bat, you're gonna run into all kinds of problems with that. So anyway, so it, it, got, it got to be such a, a divergent point of view between the environmental side and the tourism board that we ended up actually publishing two different strategies. They did theirs and we did ours. Um, that, that's how divergent things can be sometimes. So this, this, this was back in 1998, 99, I believe, and it's still pretty much there. I mean, when, when the tourism board gets involved, they, they're always looking for a way to put that seal of sustainability. And there's all kinds of uh, mechanisms that have been developed to say whether something is sustainable or not. And we could go hours and hours and days into this discussion. And um, it, it's a very long, it's, it's, there's a lot to be said about it. But um, when we talk about uh, sustainability, it's, 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 not, um, it's not a binary matter. It's not sustainable or not. Um, as she was saying uh, before, I mean, it's, so, it's very complex. And there's matters, there's different elements that involve to be able to call something, to be able to say whether something is being sustainable or not, okay? Um, so I'm gonna wrap this up. I'm gonna go more into uh, a case that is very close to me and that's the island of Cozumel, okay? Uh, the island of Cozumel, it's, it's an island in, in Mexico's Caribbean off the Yucatan Peninsula. It is roughly the size of Manhattan, but it only has a, a fraction of the population of Manhattan. Uh, there are different views as to the importance that this island had within the Mayan culture back then, but we do, what we do know for certain is that it was a very important place for um, navigation that began from Europe into the Americas and navigation from South America into the United States. It was famous as a pirate base, as a contraband center, and eventually as a strategic military position. During World War II, uh, while Cozumel's population was less than 5,000 people, the U.S. and Mexican governments signed an agreement to establish uh, a military airport and improve all of the maritime uh, port infrastructure. This was to, for, for military purposes. The, the United States wanted to have this base out in, in the Caribbean that they could use. So they created all this huge infrastructure a very small population. So then after the war, uh, with all this already set up, Cozumel was really primed and ready to be able to accept thousands of visitors if it wanted to, but it still wasn't really on the map as a tourism destination. So it only needed a spark to get things going and, and start tourism onto the island. Well, so it happens that we didn't have one spark, we had three big sparks. One of them was an article that came out in Holiday Magazine that featured Cozumel, and suddenly people in the United States knew about this island in the Caribbean. Before that, they knew about the big island right close to the United States, which was Cuba, and everyone was going there. But then the other spark was the Cuban Revolution, 
which pretty much ended American tourism into Cuba, and they started looking for another spot to go. And there was Cozumel right next to it. And the third spark that really hit was the development of scuba diving as a sport, okay? So suddenly, as a, as a, as a leisure activity, scuba diving was there. And Cozumel was a perfect place to practice this sport. So Cozumel would have pretty much remained simply a aerial and maritime layover were it not for its spectacular uh, coral reefs and ideal diving conditions. So soon after the magazine article, um, and there was also an underwater film featuring uh, the, uh, the Cozumel reefs, we started getting hotels built for the first time on the island. And so between 1950 and 1990, there was a, a gradual increase of tourism, which was in many ways very positive for the island. And the population grew from 4,282 people to 44,000 by 1990, okay? So, but this obviously is not a, a, a natural population growth. It was stimulated and it brought in, it was immigration that was coming into the island because there were job opportunities, okay? So this goes on and on. But then in the 1990s, there was something that changed and that was the cruise ship industry. The cruise ship industry went from being a high-end, uh, small, there, there were small cruise ships before, sometimes maximum 500 people, and they, there was the dining room where you would, there was a, the moment where you could dine with the captain, and the cruise ships would stop at destinations, and people would get, would get down, and most of the times they would actually stay overnight at the destination, so people would also go for the night activity at destinations and stuff. The cruise ship industry changed in the 1990s and it became massive, cheap, and very affordable for lots of people. So we started seeing these huge ships start to come in and instead of having hundreds of people, they went into the thousands. So, and again, Cosmel, due to its strategic location, it became the world's most important cruise ship destination. And so we went from having less than 10,000 cruise visitors a year to last year reaching almost 4 million visitors in a year due to cruise ships, cruise ships alone, okay? So, and again, this incredible increase in tourism brought about even more population growth rate, okay? So now we went from 44,000 to 90,000 in 10 years. Okay, it, it doubled in 10 years. So you can start seeing what's happening here. It, it's very clear. You, you don't need to be an expert in any of these subjects to understand that the resources are being used and more people are coming. And something's going to have to give at some point, right? In 2003, that's when I was sent over to Cozumel uh, to be the director of the Cozumel Reefs National Park. Um, this protected area uh, had, had faced a number of controversies and social rejection um, from the moment it was established in 1994. And there, are, there were a lot of lessons to be learned as they were talking about, and you can't, these things can't be brought down from the top down and say from now on this place is protected, all right? Um, which was one of the errors that were, that were committed that, uh, at, one, at one point. So as a resource manager, my first task was to evaluate the health of the park, of, of the ecosystem in the park primarily, okay? And in doing this evaluation, you will identify the risks and sources of pressure. Now, unfortunately, there had been no monitoring that had taken place, um, so all the information we had was primarily anecdotal. But, so, Anecdotal information is also very important. You start talking to people, and in talking to people, you start creating the connections, and you start finding out all the other details. What, what, what are, what's making people worried? Or what are they missing? What, what, what things are happening? So it's not entirely technical, right? You start bringing in the whole social aspect of it. So it, was, it, it, it soon became 
very clear that we urgently needed to come up with an idea of the carrying capacity for the island. The carrying capacity, in my case, specifically for the national park, okay? Um, so that's the technical part, right? But the truth is, we can't manage resources. There's no such thing. A resource manager cannot manage resources. At best, you can try to influence human activity around a resource, okay? Um, and this effort must always use the following phrase as a mantra, and that is, culture eats strategy for breakfast, okay? You can have the best laid out plans, but unless you have buy-in from the local community and they, their culture accepts what you're trying to do, it's just not going to work. So bringing it over to tourism, how can visitors affect this? It's a huge subject, and I, I, would, I would love that we have more time to be able to discuss it. But I think <laughs> we're yes, at the end of time here. To refresh your, <laughs> okay. To refresh your, but no, well, it was super uh, enlightening and super interesting. And yes, of course, I think maybe later when we finish, we can have even more insights, personal insights, if we, want, if we can meet outside, sure. uh, if anybody is interested. But it's definitely worth it to explain it better with more time. So thank you so much. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so I would like to proceed with Camilla Begani. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for inviting me to talk about uh, what Lugano region is doing in terms of uh, sustainability. We are currently involved in several projects, as, as, you, as you can see, and in, ex in the next few minutes, I will explain uh, uh, some, uh, I will present some of uh, um, them. This is the third year that Lugano Region jo joined the GDS Index, an index that measures sustainability in environmental, social, and economic terms. Based on the criteria of the GDS, the destination that have joined this program will be evaluated, ranked, and um, then included in the ranking of worldwide destination. Our goal as uh, Lugano Region for, for 2023 is to reach the Swiss average of 59%. Another issue that um, um, we are addressing uh, that, that's very important to us is accessibility. We are in fact engaged in various projects from uh, the collaboration with Prime Firmis and OKGO OK aimed to map uh, tourist attraction in our region and providing information um, on accessibili accessibility to tourists. To the one with Claire and George, that's a foundation uh, with the aim to ensure accessible holiday to everyone, regardless uh, to the age or uh, the disabilities. But also we have a collaboration with microinfluencer with disabilities who we, call, we can to uh, show accessible activities in our region. In the next, I, sorry, <laughs> uh, a few weeks ago, we launched our, um, sorry, I have a video. No, it doesn't work. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, no problem. Yes. Okay, perfect. Sorry for the inconvenience. 
So, <laughs> in the, uh, a few weeks ago, we launched our new website and we improved the sustainability web page by making it more user friendly. Here are a small video about uh, um, this, how it looks like this uh, web page. As you can see, it respects the steps of a possible tourist journey. Um, the, public of, the use of public transport to discover our region is our first point. The second one is a section focusing on hotels that, that have certification and label such as um, sustainable, a uh, program of uh, uh, Switzerland tourism. While the third section is dedicated to local products that can be found in our region, for example, uh, honey, wines, um, cheeses, uh, fruits, and so on, but also to the restaurant that use local ingredients in the dishes on their menu. Is just the last one with this one. <laughs> Thank you so much, and <laughs> I'm at your disposal for any kind of question. Thank you. Thank you so much. And actually, it was uh, we were very glad that we had some representation from Ticino region because. We are in Ticino, and one of uh, like uh, without all this system, we couldn't be here. So thank you again for joining us. Um, and then we go. Uh, I just need to find yours. And it was a yes. We are on it. Thank you. <laughs> okay, uh, good morning everybody and uh, thank you very much for, for inviting me to uh, today. So my name is Bruno Golferini and uh, I'm going to talk about uh, Villa Ceo, which is a, a hotel, boutique hotel that I founded in 2015 uh, near between uh, Lake Como, Ticino, Vigiu, it's called the name, it's uh, in, uh, in Italy. Um, I think I have the, the clicker, so the, oh, okay. thank you. Okay, so I'm just going to show you some, some pictures and then we'll touch on the different, uh, different aspects and points that we, we, we talked about today. So Villa El Ceo is a, is a historical villa. So it, uh, it, it used to be a, a house, but then it was transformed into a boutique hotel in uh, uh, 2015. So there, I mainly organize weddings and uh, events, as well as we have uh, 13 uh, rooms, and it's in constant development. So unlike maybe the other presentation here, it's uh, growing, the tourism is growing, but we are somehow creating already a model from the beginning that should be uh, sustainable and gives also work and, uh, um, to, the, to the local population because we hire only people uh, people from the village that uh, uh, work at the villa and uh, we buy everything uh, within uh, one kilometer uh, from f from the villa so we don't buy other things and uh, we farm raise and uh, and have everything produced on site we have animals uh, our own products goats chickens vegetables yeah so this is uh, the the inside is a uh, belle époque liberty villa built in 1870, and then there is a process, there um, been a constant process of conservation of, uh, of, the, of the property, and uh, each year we are uh, trying to, to, to improve uh, all the services. So briefly, uh, mm, an introduction of myself. I, I work in uh, at the Villa Ceo, and then I, I also study uh, international uh, tourism in uh, Uzi, in Lugano. And uh, my background is uh, from a hotel school in, uh, in Lausanne. And uh, well, mainly, as I said, we organize uh, events and, uh, and weddings, particularly, uh, particularly destination weddings of uh, guests, uh, mainly Americans, uh, that come uh, and organize.
nice weddings here. So this is uh, the, the villa. And uh, in terms of rooms, we have uh, 13 rooms and suites. They all have a special, special design uh, because uh, we, we make uh, everything uh, like from, let's say, respecting the, the style of the, of the villa and also the, the architecture, reusing also the different furniture, so not buying like new, new furniture, for example, but reusing almost everything. So it's a lot about craftsmen. So I care about a lot about the design. I do also physically the, the jobs of, uh, of uh, building the, the rooms. And uh, um, just to touch on your presentation before, we have a yurt as well uh, that uh, we're opening this year. So <laughs> inside the, the park, so close to the animals, you're able to feed the, the animals in the morning, the goats, and uh, there is also a vegetable garden there. We will have a, our spa opening this year. And we offer also gourmet cuisine, but with special attention of the products that we, we farm raise uh, on, on site. So in summer, we tend not to buy anything outside, but it's all our vegetables, all our uh, ingredients. So this is uh, the attic uh, inside, inside the, the villa. And uh, also some of the horses and uh, vegetable garden and uh, future projects. Uh, so I'm currently starting a, a project uh, as a thesis of the, of the Master in International Tourism uh, with uh, partnership of UNESCO. So regarding uh, regenerative, uh, regenerative uh, tourism and how people can uh, uh, discover the, the area, respecting, of course, the environment, sustaining the, the people in the, in the area. And uh, mm, we found uh, a water source directly inside the park of the villa, which comes from uh, Monte San Giorgio. So in this water, it has uh, uh, beneficial, uh, beneficial elements, uh, Therapeutic, therapeutic uh, elements is very rich in magnesium, and so we, we give it to, to the guests there. And uh, yeah, so this is a bit uh, about uh, about what what uh, what we do. And thank you very much for your attention. So uh, again, really a very deep thank you to all of you. And uh, as I received from the Reggie, uh, uh, we still would have like 50, 10 minutes before the lunch. Um, so uh, the beginning was planned some question from me and from uh, the Green Office. But I would say, as you just have heard from uh, this amazing um, uh, panelists with different uh, topics and subjects, but anyway, always related with sustainability. I would like now to put, if you, if we have five minutes, just to put a spark of interaction here. So asking if you have some question or general question or specific question for uh, one of them or all of them. So thank you. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. So, uh, thanks for the presentations. I mean, if I could summarize the common thread in all of them is a love for the local culture and sustaining that for future generations. And that's wonderful. Um, I have the tendency to introduce elephants in the room. The elephant in the room in this case is air travel, right? So we heard about Brazil, Mexico, Mongolia, Australia, these places are long, long way away, right? So presumably the tourists who are going there for sustainable tourism are flying there. So my question is very simple, uh, posed to all of you. Have you ever done an analysis of the carbon footprint of the people who are going to these distant destinations with air travel and coming back end to end from their door back to their home? And perhaps have you considered the tourist who drives to uh, Arbostora, for example, in a diesel car, and compared the footprint of that to the ones who are going to Mongolia, for example, for sustainable tourism? Have you done that calculation? 
Thank you very much. It's very interesting questions. I get back to the stage. <laughs> and if there is some volunteer, Robert, I am the next. Yeah, I mean, this is a, a very obvious, obvious question that is in the room, definitely. Um, I mean, we know that the tourism sector has about, makes about 8% of the whole carbon emission in total, so it's a, it's a large point, that is true, and mostly is regarded to travel, to uh, transfer, to how to go there, and on the, of course, air travel. And our destination, it is true, it is far, and most of them are only available approachable by, tr by air travel uh, because the train systems are not yet done. So um, yes, we haven't done any calculations yet. We are not in, in this position to uh, like logistically do this. I mean, we have data, which is good. So this is also a project in the future we want to do. I mean, what we are thinking about is uh, putting on like an environmental tax on, on our products, on our tours. We, um, we, we sell to donate into projects that reduce carbon, carbon emission. That is something we're trying or thinking about doing. Um, I mean, there are also s things you can do when you travel. I mean, where you can used to public transport, used to train systems. Also in our uh, underdevelopment uh, countries, there's already stuff going on towards de development into more public transport or much more train transport, as well as if you fly long distance, then take a direct flight. Don't go the cheapest flight and go via several stops, like take a, a direct flight wherever you go, and then rather stay longer than just travel to the next destination. Travel longer, stay longer, really get to know a country, and maybe do once in a, in a year a, a big trip and rather do some smaller trips around your, your home place. I mean, here we have so many nice places to discover. So yeah, I would say this is the, the recommendations I have for the airplane travels, yes. But it's, of course, it's something um, we still have to keep in mind. I mean, I know that there are some things going on with uh, um, uh, technologies, future technologies in the airport industry. I think the, the VEF is currently doing some stuff uh, that they are trying to bring the big players in the game to use this more efficient and more sustainable ways of traveling in the airport industry. But I mean, that's probably still a long way to go. Never too shy. Um, it's. Definitely, I mean, it, it is the big elephant in the room. There, there's no doubt about it. I mean, um, but as destinations, it's, it's hard for you to really actually have an impact on them. So that's where the, the idea of linkages and partnerships can actually have an, an impact, okay? Where when destinations can start working with uh, the various airlines that, that travel to them, um, that, that's what um, they can start giving preferential treatment um, because I mean, a lot of the a lot of what you pay, pay for your airfare is uh, the local taxes of, of actually landing at a certain airport so one of the things that has been looked at is how can those taxes be reduced or give preferential tariff with airlines that are offsetting their carbon you know I mean, Again, as a destination, and you can't say it's not my problem, because it is, but at the same time, it's not something that you can directly change. But you can, you can affect it, just, just the same way as a visitor can have a positive or negative impact on a destination. A destination can have a positive or negative impact on the way it reaches its agreements for air travel. I agree, is like the big effort and the big issues. Uh, that's why maybe talking in terms of just sustainable tourism, maybe it's not pointless, uh, because in, the, in this case, maybe it's much more sustainable not traveling to some place. And in fact, uh, we are mostly um, focused on the, the sustainability aspect issue related with the activities play, uh, the activity realized in, on site at destination when the 
by far, I don't know the numbers exactly, but particularly for those uh, displacing themselves with, uh, with a flight, uh, on average, the highest uh, carbon footprint is produced even before experiencing the destination. So maybe you are very concerned about the hotel, you are uh, um, where you stay and the activity you realize, but the most of your uh, uh, carbon footprint was already done just by displacing yourself. There are some, it's very difficult to tackle that uh, uh, from the uh, destination perspective. I know, for example, Bern, I think last year, so some months ago, tried to develop uh, a, a new strategy of the marketing, try to not uh, promoting the destination of Bern to those uh, market uh, that uh, necessarily require a flight uh, for reaching Bern. So they decide to concentrate the promotional uh, promotional campaigns just to the surrounding areas or the, the, the surrounding countries. But this is very effective. Well, it's just something that maybe go in the, in the proper way, but it could be not the only strategies. Thank you so much to all of you. Uh, do you, we still have five minutes and then we need to go to the lunch, uh, to lunch but yeah, for sure, I mean. Maybe you can couple the questions. Um, okay, so I, um, something that we kind of talked about before the panel started um, was that Franklin students really value travel. However, we're not necessarily working maybe with the same budget as someone who's earning an income as international students. Um, and so you had mentioned environmental taxes and direct flights, which are things that maybe might not be, what? Yeah, and slow travel, which are things that might not be necessarily feasible for specifically university students um, or younger generations in general maybe. Um, so I guess my question is, do you think that there is a possibility for affordable, sustainable travel or is that, yeah, I don't know. I wanna, I wanna add on to her question as well, as long, say going off of like, is there a way to affordably, or travel sustainably affordably, but also is it traveling and experiencing and learning about these cultures and places we're going, because I think that's something Franklin really values. Is it worth it for the education over sustainability? I think that's kind of what I've been asking myself since being here, um, because I have had so many like experiences, but is it is it fair? Is it worth it? I don't know. I feel really bad sometimes. Well, thank you very much for the very good questions. I go back and yes, in the meanwhile, in, ah, oh, okay. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, <laughs> I see this oxymoron, right, what you're talking about. Um, I think for in my perspective, uh, perspective of, I, just, I think I tried to tell this at the end, I think that traveling is really important for our society. And I think for especially for young people, I think traveling is so important because it just makes us understand the world better, it makes us experience more, it makes us grow more, and it, it, it lets us get to know other cultures and this creates just a more acceptance and also not being afraid of something else and least makes us mo grow more. So yes, I don't, wouldn't say like, uh, don't, um, not do it, but yes, I can understand that um, these traveling options are probably not too uh, affordable for, for everybody. So, um, yeah, I can't, I don't have the right, right answer for that question yet, but um, I think that are still ways to travel sustainable on a lower budget. Um, it depends also on, you know, how you travel in the country. I mean, there are still sustainable options that are more affordable than others, so I wouldn't say this is not possible. But yes, I think maybe it's just a budget thing, how you put it on where you put the most costs on and just, yeah, rather do less but more intense than, you know, go to several places and this costs you also more than rather save up the money and do it right, yeah. Talking about in, in 
Cozumel, uh, <coughs> where the, with the cruise ship industry, okay, where suddenly it's a lot cheaper to travel. And a lot of people, they would not travel were it not for those cheap prices. So saying, well, they should raise the prices. Then you get into the whole social part. There is, I, are you being is, is, are, are we being discriminatory by demanding all tourism should be more sustainable? You know, I mean, there's a whole lot of things that, that get involved there. And then it finally ends up in the final question, is tourism necessary? No, I mean, what, what, what is this? What, 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 how much do you need to move away from your local residents to be able to be considered a tourist? Is walking into the forest around here being a tourist? Does going all the way out to Gambaroño or, or Lago Maggiore, now, does that now turn you into a tourist? Do you have to cross a border to be a tourist? How much time do we have? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's, this would be a long a discussion. Huge, it's a huge question. <laughs> So yes, again, I'm sorry that we are quite strict with the time, uh, and I th really believe that this kind of discussion w could take like hours that to be really discussed in a proper way. Uh, so I just think that now we can go for uh, the next session would be the lunch, <laughs> and then. Uh, but I continue. I mean, I I really think that if, if everybody have further questions or you want they w you want to discuss more, you can reach directly our expert and uh, our experts or mm, I mean trying to discuss for some specific uh, topic or, or, or at a broader um, approach but please um, do it so don't worry and uh, like uh, you can also ask us if you don't have the emails and so on uh, but thank you so much all for coming and it was everything was really interesting in my opinion.